Our scripture reading is from Acts chapter 5, verses 17 through 32. Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, We found the jail securely locked, with the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I um, was remembering uh, this week a, a book that uh, came out. Well, I'm not going to tell you how long ago this book came out. I was in college. Let's just leave it at that. Uh, it's by an author and uh, illustrator called uh, Dave McCauley, and the book was called Motel of Mysteries, and the premise of the book was that in the year 4000, archaeologists uncovered a roadside motel, and they thought that it was a necropolis, a, a cemetery, an ancient burial site, and so as they were moving through uh, the space, they, they interpreted all those spaces uh, in that way, so they saw the altar in what they thought was the outer sanctuary. Uh, actually, they probably weren't far off on this one, but uh, they saw the altar and they said there is a, even a spot where people could recline as they meditated against the mysteries of life and death. Uh, and then they uh, went through that outer chamber into what they thought was the burial chamber and uh, found the sarcophagus there. And uh, they found some ritual objects uh, like the sacred urn. Um, as near as they could tell, the uh, priest would utter incantations into the urn uh, as the waters of life flowed through it, and uh, he would deposit uh, bits of the sacred skull, uh, uh, scrolls into the urn. And he would do so uh, wearing uh, this sacred pendant around his neck and this headdress. Now, that's a cautionary tale for us, right? about the certainty we have about history from the little bits and pieces that we have dug up across the years, and especially when it comes to proving whether a thing did or didn't actually happen, maybe the way it's uh, given to us in certain texts. But it also is a reminder to us that we can tell what... <laughs> we identify things by their purpose, right? Um, there was a show some years ago called The Liars Club. I, I talked with someone after a service not too long ago who remembered this show. I loved it because they had this panel of, um, of, of guests who would hold up an in, unusual object and they would tell a story about what that object was used for and the uh, contestants had to figure out which of the three stories was the truth. Uh, here are some objects that you might uh, see in an antique shop, okay? Who would like to take a guess what this object is used for? And it's not a medieval torture device. Yeah. Uh, it, in fact, it goes in a cutting board that has a special hole in it, and it holds the ham in place while you slice it. 
Okay, what about this one? I'm sure you've all got one of these at home. It is an abacus, it's a form of an abacus, uh, but this one actually is from the Himalayan mountains and it's a calendar. It's used to keep track of the days and the weeks and the months and the years. And this one. You probably have one of these in either your purse or your billfold. This is a customer loyalty card from the turn of the uh, uh, 19th century. Uh, it turns out this is not a new idea. It's just electronic now, and back then they had a little dog tag that you would take to the store and show, yes, I'm a regular customer, and you got special treatment. So we identify things by their purpose, and we look at them, and we try to guess what is the purpose of this object. And the question we're going to explore some today is the question of our purpose. Now, we're in a series uh, called What I Learned from COVID, and we're looking to the early church to help kind of reinforce some of the things that I've heard people say, you know, that became very important to me during COVID. We uh, talked uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago about the importance of community and, and and how important that was to the early church. Last week we talked about the importance of seeing other people and not forgetting that we're dealing with human beings when we're reaching out across the internet or through the little black box at the drive through window. Today we're, um, we're talking about the idea of purpose. As Sequoia said before we started today, Many of us at some time or another had our daily routines disrupted during COVID. We didn't go to school for a while. We didn't go to work for a while. And the question that that poses is, if I don't have anything on my calendar, what is my purpose? Why would I get out of bed? And we dodge that question by keeping ourselves busy lots of the time. You know, if I've got stuff on my calendar, I must, I must be full of purpose. I must be accomplishing things. But that's sort of a substitute in a way. That's sort of a, uh, almost a drug to keep us from thinking about, what am I really here about? What am I supposed to be doing with my life? And we can turn to the early church and, and, and the passage that was read this morning as an example of a group that was on fire with purpose. I mean, stop and think for a moment about what's going on in the lives of these apostles and their stubborn refusal to give up their mission. That's a church word, but it, it, it's about purpose. I know what I'm supposed to do. I know what I'm called to. I know what I got out of bed this morning. This is what I'm going to do. And the book of Acts dances through this little rhythm back and forth between all the reasons that should have dissuaded them and the fact that they just kept on going, right? If you go back a little bit before today's scripture reading, uh, you'll discover uh, that they had, the apostles had been called in from preaching the gospel and said, stop it. Don't do that anymore. We don't like it when you do that. But they kept on going. Did, Today, they're arrested and beaten in today's scripture reading. And yet they keep preaching. They're jailed eventually. And they keep preaching. Eventually, some of them are martyred to the cause and they keep preaching. They keep about their mission. They have a purpose that is so deeply ingrained in them that not only do they keep going when everything gets difficult, not only do they cling to it when everything around them seems to be falling apart, but, but at today's scripture reading, that marvelous passage, they rejoiced. They rejoiced even in their hardships, because we know what we are here to do. Their stubbornness in mission, in spite of all that they went through and all the difficulties they faced, 
Well, N.T. Wright puts it this way. He said, the strongest evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the early church. The world around them did everything they could to exterminate them. But something must have happened. Something must have happened in their lives that convinced them that they were going to be about this business no matter what from now on. And they did. Now, you, you, it's probably a good idea if we ask, so what is that purpose, right? And on the one hand, uh, it appears in the stories to be simply proclaiming the gospel, speaking the good news, telling people the story of Jesus. Let me tell you about these new truths that have become evident in the world. To, to, to kind of preserve and proclaim this new truth. But I, I, I want to dig a little bit deeper because I don't think that's the whole story of their purpose here. Because if it were, they might have gone about it in a little bit different way. If what we're trying to do is get the news out, if our primary purpose in the world is to make sure that people know what we know, then you write it down and you send it out across as many channels as you can. And the world that they were living in was ready made for this. For the f first time in history, really, the, we, we talk about the cruelty of the Romans and, and, and their excesses, and, but, but what they brought to the world, as strange as it seems to us in modern times, their, the, their greatest innovation was roads. They connected long, paved, level roads from city to city so that their messages could travel at the speed of horseback. They, information was traveling across these roads at un unprecedented speeds and across unprecedented distances. And so one approach to spreading these bullet points of the gospel would be, let's get it written down and let's send it out in as many directions as we can under this tremendous information superhighway that the Romans have built into existence. And yet, that's not what we see going on in the early church. Most scholars will tell you the Gospels didn't even get written down until, you know, maybe 80 or 90 years after the birth of Christ, 50 years or more after his death. All that time, nobody bothered to write these stories down and pass them along in written form. Why is that? And, and there's a hint in today's passage, maybe more than a hint. You have to uh, remember the old uh, Schoolhouse Rock Conjunction Junction. You, you, uh, uh, thank you for one of, the, one of the younger folks here in the sanctuary began to sing it. That made me feel a little bit better. I thought maybe... I thought maybe it was an artifact of, my, uh, of the olden days, but yeah, conjunction, junction, what's your function? Yeah, and it talks about all the words we use to connect things together. And we have this marvelous word at the very beginning of today's scripture reading, then. Okay, so I looked it up and it's not a conjunction, it's an adverb. But it does the same work, right? Whatever was going on happened, and then this next thing happened. And, and it, it behooves us to kind of go back and, and, and say, okay, so what did it happen, and what did it launch? What happened, and what is it launching? How did this story that I'm getting ready to tell connect to the one that I've already told? And, and we can go back over the last couple of weeks to the stories that we've read here. We started with the Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell on the church. Here's my question. When the Holy Spirit fell on the church and the apostles ran out in the streets and began to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ in every tongue on earth, what was the official response to that? What did the authorities do in response to that? Nothing. But the, then last week we read this story about uh, James and John, uh, Peter and, and John, going up the temple steps, and they heal a man. 
And suddenly, the authorities get very involved. That's when they begin talking to the, to the disciples and say, no, you, you can't be doing that. They are arrested and turned loose. That doesn't stop them. Peter is proclaiming the gospel again. They arrest him and put him in jail overnight. And in the night, an angel comes to release him from prison. And where does he go? I'll tell you where I would have gone. Anybody with me on the next train out of town? Right? Where did he, he went right back to the temple courts because he had this mission to proclaim the good news. We're told that the whole, when, he is, <clears throat> when he is released after the trial, we're given this beautiful picture of, uh, uh, of what happens. We're, we're told that the place where they were staying uh, shook. We're, we're given this picture of, of the fellowship of believers having all things in common. We're given this picture of the Holy Spirit at work in their midst. And then, and then, we hear that the priests become nervous. And then we hear that they go out to arrest Peter. After this beautiful picture of the church living in an entirely different way, where they see people, where they unite themselves to one another, it's in the wake of the Holy Spirit doing that work in the life of the church that the powers that be get very nervous. These are unschooled men, they say. Now that doesn't mean didn't mean to them what it means to us. What, what that, my, grand, my grandfather dropped out of school after sixth grade. Uh, that doesn't mean he wasn't smart. He just, you know, he found another path through life. And that's how we think of unschooled these days. But in, in ancient times, in, in the times in which uh, the apostles are serving, to be unschooled means I'm not connected to anybody. The schools they're talking about are the schools of the philosophers. It, it, it means I'm not connected to any particular school of thought. The, these people, where are they even coming from? All we know about them is that they used to know Jesus, and somehow that has empowered them and infused them with this new kind of life. Look how they treat each other. Look how they are towards one another. Look how God seems to bless them every time they come together. Look how... They respond to the world around them. And that makes the authorities nervous and the perse persecution of the church begins. It's not enough to stop them, mind you. Because they're stubborn in their mission and in their purpose, and they continue to be bold. They continue to boldly go. Pardon me, Buzz, the split infinitive. They continue to go boldly. So when, when Peter is released from jail by the angel, she tells him what to do. She's probably a he, actually. The angel tells him what to do. It reads like this in 520. Go stand in the temple courts and tell the people all about this new life. That's the commandment. And I, I just want you to catch the words here. What's the message? It's the message of this new way. It's the message that's made the authorities nervous. It's not the bullet points of what we, you know, we call it the Apostles' Creed, but what was really important in the early church and what really made the authorities around them nervous was not what they said they believed. It was the way they lived. This God-empowered life of fellowship and service. Go stand in the temple courts and tell the people about this new way of doing it this new way of living. I 
That's why they didn't write it down and send it out, because it wasn't that simple. They weren't just communicating doctrine. They were communicating a way of life, and they were communicating it by doing it. Look how the Lord blesses when we live like this. This is one thing to talk, and it's another thing to do, right? Um, the the uh, place name Chernobyl. Yeah, it's a place, but it's become a byword to us uh, of the of the dangers of uh, the the possible dangers of nuclear power and what happens when 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 the process breaks down, right? What many people don't know is that that disaster at Chernobyl, uh, one reason some people say why it took place is because um, many of the, uh, uh, of the leaders there were away that day at a training event on, a training event on how to deal with nuclear disasters. Well, it didn't matter what they knew because they weren't there to do it. It's an um, old story about uh, Glenn Miller, a uh, great big band uh, leader. And um, uh, after rehearsal one night, uh, one of his trumpet players came to him and he, and he said, uh, um, Glenn, I hate to tell you this, but the new trumpet player you just hired, there's a problem. And he said, what's the problem? And he said, well, I sat th beside the man all the way through rehearsal, and I don't believe he reads music. And Glenn Miller's response it was, uh, that's good. If I catch him reading when he's supposed to be playing, I'll fire him. Because musicians know something, really, it takes a while to learn it. The notes on the page are not the music. The music happens when it's performed. When sound comes up out of our hearts and out of our mouths and fills the room around us. The, the notes on the page are suggestions. The notes on the page And I want to suggest to you that that's, that's the good news that the apostles were trying to pass on. Could I write it down and give it to you? Well, eventually they did. They tried that. But their first and greatest means of communicating was watch, watch, watch what I'm doing and watch how God is blessing it. And when you live like that and God blesses, that fills you with a sense of purpose. It's worth getting out of bed in the morning. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, let God's people say,
And now will you receive the benediction of our Lord. Now may the grace of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us today. May he empower us to live out the truth of the gospel in fellowship and community, in service and in love. That we might not simply jot down the notes of what we believe, but display the fullness of it to the world around us as God's people. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, let God's people say,